اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ففهمنا سليمان وكلنا اتينا حكما وعلما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي لا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم سبحانك لا مهنا عليك الا لا تنسني ولا تنسني الحمد لله عبد الحمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وسائر نبينا والصالحين وسلم على موفقني واهدني وسددني واجمعني بين الصواب والثواب واعذني من الخطا والهرمان امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته and welcome to a series of civic engagements or civic programs that we faqul ulama have been holding over the last few years normally obviously they take place in a masjid or a, in some form of islamic center or community center but as obviously the pandemic seems to have controlled all matters at the moment so as a result we are on this platform this time round inshallah and it may be that folk who don't necessarily have the ability to engage uh, when it is in the masjid Uh, especially uh, the sisters may get an opportunity now to be able to engage uh, directly with ulama especially the topic itself the pertinent topic that it is and what let's just move on to the topic for now what's the pe- pe- what's the whole reason for this program well one thing which has come to light um, over this pandemic has been unfortunately the expressing of opinions by individuals who lack expertise and i don't want to sort of predict uh what's going to be said and discussed over the next hour and a half or hour or so but i do want to kind of set the scene unfortunately we've seen people with no medical qualifications whatsoever no medical experience whatsoever espousing things on matters which are of life and death similarly and equally and you some would argue more importantly we have seen people speaking about matters which impact on the soul and the soul's future uh, in the next life and what should and shouldn't be done now let's not you know let's not be misunderstand that ulama don't shy away from good genuine academic debate and academic discussion with their peers uh, but what we're seeing unfortunately is the use of uh, social media in particular uh, the odd video being made uh and then slanderous comments and those videos then being shared or like or literally like wildfire on whatsapp and things of that nature now today our guest is uh mufti faisal al mahmudi and uh mufti faisal i've known for coming up to a, a decade now uh a fantastic chap i hope he doesn't mind me saying i'm sure he doesn't mind me saying in fact uh canadian he studied extensively the islamic sciences Uh, more recently uh, he has studied in south africa under the auspices direction and guidance of mufti ibrahim de saisa but not only that as with most uh, uh, learned students we see i have had that opportunity as well where you see those students expressing a capacity and capability which is usually beyond their years and also beyond their experience and this i hope mufti faisal doesn't mind me saying is something which mufti faisal also demonstrated and as a result he took responsibility for the darul ifta in south africa whilst under tutelage moving on he then obviously returned back to his uh, uh, homeland of canada and there he has set up his own uh, sort of research center teaching a- 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 academy uh, ilmhub.co.uk uh, oh, sorry .com i always get the uh, .co's and .com's wrong you'll correct me anyway i'm sure you will uh, when he joins us inshallah and uh, he is our special guest and he's he's been picked in particular uh because again i hope he doesn't mind me saying my interactions with him makes me think you know that I, we see a young talented individual here who doesn't leave a stone unturned when he's trying to determine a particular matter and he shares numerous matters with me uh in, in just for a, an opinion and a view and i can see that the quality that the the, the, the mufti faisal sahib is producing and i'm sure there will be more to come from him in the future may allah accept it from him i mean so uh before i literally call him in and and in, and, and give him our salam and your salam and my salam uh, what's the purpose of the topic so or what's the purpose of the subject matter itself well the subject matter is as we put on the tin which is first of all why ask ulama questions in the first place you know why do we need some people are of the view that why do we need to always go to ulama you know goodness me we're free thinking individuals we're not like those village people 
uh, which is obviously said in a condescending derogatory way and not that you know we see anything wrong with village people it's a way of life that people have chosen well here let's just put ourselves in their shoes that people are you know backwards you know they needed to go to Molvi Saab in the village and ask him questions where you know uh, free thinking capable rational Uh, so as I was saying, and then we're going to explore other questions uh, with regards to once we have found that particular individual, uh, how do we pose a question to him or her? Uh, gen generally, we find it's a him, but how do we pose the questions to them? But there are occurrences when sisters feel more confident to ask Alima's questions, uh, particularly if it's of a, fe a feminine nature. How do we pose that question? How do we how do we address them? What will we say? How much details should we provide them? So we're going to, inshallah, over the next hour, or just under an hour, we're going to explore those questions. But anyway, I, I've said enough, so I'm now going to uh, uh, call on uh, Mufti Faisal Saab for him to join us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Mufti Faisal Saab, how are you? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, la kulli hal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-Muslim, amma ba'd. Yes, uh, Jazakallah for that introduction and for your uh, good words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me um, as you expect of me. Uh, I, I keep making dua that, uh, that these kind of expectations are, are really high for myself. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me reach there as well, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> the, the points that you have mentioned, alhamdulillah, it, it does lay out uh, a good uh, introduction to what, what we, we wish to discuss today. Uh, so in the brief moment, uh, we, we did get disconnected from your audio, by the way, right? So we, we, we didn't hear a po last portion of it, uh, but I'm going to, inshallah, begin uh, because, because we understand the, the question is, why ask the ulama when we, when we are capable of uh, looking into th things ourselves? And this was the case when we were studying ourselves in the universities and everything, and people would tell us, oh, no, we can, we can simply go on to the uh, Hadith database, search for something, and oh, mashallah, the words of, words of Rasulullah are right in front of us. Why do we need an, an, another third party to come and interpret them and tell them why, why such and such is there? So addressing this, um, let's lay down a premise and, 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 and a preface to it. Um, our objective, no matter where we are, whether we are academics, whether we are uh, general professionals or laymen, no matter who we are, the objective is and the aim is uh, in the religion is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, become accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The religion is there only as a dictate and a guideline from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So obviously, it, it automatically brings in the, the aspect that whatever we wish to do, it has to be a dictate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, when we uh, see that we are acquiring knowledge from for deen and everything, we have to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said uh, to us uh, in, by himself. <clears throat> You had mentioned the ayah in the uh, in the introductory advertisement uh, uh, as well. The uh, first alu ahla dikri in kuntum la ta'alamu. That uh, that uh, relays an important uh, basic obligation of an individual. If he does not know something about a deen, then he needs to go and seek the people of zikr, people of knowledge, people of understanding of that particular aspect, so that he, uh, he can gain that information. So um, uh, just just as that, uh, in any matter, uh, uh, right now we are living in the contemporary times, fourteen hundred years after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Had it been that Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was among us then we, we could simply just go and ask him and he would be the Ahl al-Dhikr for us. And we would just simply go to him, ask him, get, get the problem sorted out and be on our life. We would not go, uh, go ahead and start uh, uh, discussing, oh, but uh, uh, so, so, uh, so many days before you said this and now you said this and why did you make the change and everything, we would not have done that. Because he is the shari', he is the one who is relaying the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would have just taken it samayana wa atana and we would have carried on. Now the time has gone ahead and we have become more intellectual than, than, the, than uh, so to say, the sahaba and uh, that, uh, that we want to actually want to sit down and discuss all those aspects, we still realize that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has left uh, Quran and Sunnah for us to deduce from, to take from. However, at the same time, that merely having the Quran and Sunnah itself is not going to be sufficient when the uh, faqih or anyone who wants to deduce the knowledge, he'll have to go through the Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, Qiyas, all the four uh, sources of uh, Sharia to acquire the knowledge uh, from out of it. 
that gives a deeper concern that uh, it may not just be sufficient enough to get the information and then a practice upon it. You need to know the filter, the right, right way of approach, right way of angle of looking at that information and then process it and then uh, come out with the uh, final conclusion. For, uh, for example, just, just because uh, if you are sick and you're taking some medication, just merely taking the medication is not sufficient. It has to be diagnosed what the problem is. The medication has to be the right medicine. And then if you take it, then uh, um, with the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you will get, gain some seha out of it. So it is important how you're going to address that. If, if, if I may come in there, Mufti Faisal Sahib, I, I just have a question. If I was, say, a member of the public now, and uh, unfortunately, um, I wasn't in a community where there was a, a local masjid uh, that I could access the imam, how do I now go? I, wanna, I want an answer on a particular matter. Who, who do I go see? Uh, how do I determine, you know, everybody calls themselves sheikh now. Uh, somebody might study for three weeks on an online course and somebody might study for 10 years. How, how can you, you know, without me kind of putting words in your mouth, can you give an outlay uh, for me as, a, as just a member of the public that I should go to, you know, seek answers from this person rather than seek answers from that person? What should my criteria be? And, and looking, looking at it, when you are going to be approaching anybody for question and answers or getting your, your questions answered, uh, you do want to approach somebody who has knowledge, some basis, some fundamental aspect behind him. Uh, as we say in, in, in um, Urdu, Neem Hakim Khadrajan. Right. If you go to uh, go to a, a do-it-yourself webmd.com or something like that, there is a chance that your life will be in danger. Similarly, Neem Mullah Khatra Iman. You you may go to some Asura uh, uh, scholar or half student who has still not uh, worked out all his kinks, uh, and you may ask him something, and it may be detrimental to your uh, Iman. So uh, when you are approaching somebody, uh, make your due diligence of, of finding the right individual. You uh, you are living living within the community and sometimes you are not in the, the same community but you can still do a background check and find out like oh who is uh, who is this individual find, um, um, i normally say like you know when you are uh, act actively seeking the scholars of repute try to uh, get close to them try to live within them to see whether they fulfill the hukuk or the or the um, the mandate of a person who is a mutabi'a sunnah who has uh, who is following the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam who has a temperament of, of uh, seeking the higher planes of taqwa and wara so that when you answer him his answer is going, also going to elevate you to that level of uh, wara and taqwa otherwise uh, uh, what will happen is you're only going to be looking at the frequently asked question uh, the, the the q and a and then you you merely end up acquiring information without much deliberation of practice beyond that. So the initial stages, that's what you should be looking at. That, that's an interesting point there, Mufti Fesab, that you make there, is that if we compare it to any other science, then the person themselves, we don't really look at, you know, we, you know I don't look at my doctor to find out, you know, how much taqwa that my doctor has or or when I go call my plumber in, I don't necessarily look at the taqwa that my plumber has. I look at who I feel maybe is the best plumber, whatever. But it's an interesting point that when we're seeking Sharia knowledge, uh, that we're not we're not just looking at the kind of academic level, but we're also looking at the person's behavior and character. Is that correct? Have I understood and, that? And, and, and that's absolutely correct. See, uh, see uh, when we're looking at uh, professionals of uh, other secular uh, areas, what we judge them is how they're. Um, uh, fruits or how the outcome of their knowledge and information uh, presents itself into our world. For example, a plumber, you mentioned uh, whether the plumber, he, he has good reviews with regards to his expertise. And uh, if, if he, he comes and fixes my pipes and that two days later, the pipes are still broken, then obviously he's not a good plumber. But when we, we talk about scholars and ulama, the, the purpose of the entire purpose is to link towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that wara and the taqwa and the, and the high, a higher understanding of uh, the spiritual benefit. So if we are going to seek uh, the, the fruit of a scholar, it has to be that after engagement with him, you should feel that you have actually uh, gone up a higher scale of actually connecting towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and you mentioned there, Sheikh, as well about reviews. Now, you know, when we're going to get a, a, a tradesman, we might go on to uh, some kind of system, some agency that, that people are reviewing this person. It, that's the same, isn't it, when it comes to a Shari scholar? That if, say, for example, there's a scholar 
uh, like all the way in, say, South Africa or Canada or whatever, mm. that you go approach your local senior ulama or those ulama of your country and you say, you know, Sheikh Mufti, uh, what, what do you, what do the ulama say about this person? Because Correct. awam can get confused, can't they? You get a lot of celebrity mm. uh, people now, uh, people of scholars on, on, on websites and YouTubes and all the rest of it, uh, where awam feel because there's a huge following that this person must be a, 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 a person of repute. But, sh you know, we should, should, should we be looking at the expert's opinion rather than Absolutely. Joe Public's opinion? Absolutely. And uh, when, when it comes to religion and being, uh, what we realize is this is not something new. Um, I was just giving the discourse with regards to the, the Hanafi structure of fiqh. And uh, we were talking about Imam Abu Hanifa's and his, his maqam as a, as a muhaddith. So uh, I, I mentioned over there that we are not going to assess uh, Imam Abu Hanifa's maqam according to what we feel, because we, we are laities compared to Imam Abu Hanifa. So when we are going to discuss about him, we'll have to look at his own peers. And when we realize that uh, giants like Imam Shafi is saying that, uh, that uh, people are children uh, in, fiqh, uh, uh, in the court of Imam Abu Hanifa, then we realize that even the peers, they are accepting him as, as a genuine scholarship and everything, then we don't need to worry about uh, our inquisition into the matter. Right. And, and once we do that, and once we realize that among the, uh, our general uh, uh, communities, if the other scholars are accepting a particular uh, person of repute as an accepted scholar, as an accepted uh, uh, intellectual, then we, we must recognize, okay, our inter, uh, uh, intervention into it or our uh, uh, introspection into it is not going to reveal anything different. Mufti Sab, you are muted. Right? Yeah, I know. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an absolute vital point, uh, point that you make. And, you know, this is something that we all need to kind of really understand is that, you know, seek uh, advice from scholars which you know of. They could be individuals that have been associated with your families, with your local masjid, people who are, you know, respected, and then mention this particular scholar. I'm taking views from this particular scholar. I'm learning from this particular scholar. What do, what do you say about it? But, you know, Mufti uh, now, you know, Alhamdulillah, we've got so much information, you know, uh, you could go on now. There are so many Twitter channels you could follow that will share a hadith with you and so many things like that. Uh, why is it that, you know, we we kind of can't just, just engage with that? Why do we need this, this filtration? Why do we need this? Faqih intervention. Why, why, why can't we just work with the sources? You know, why do we need the? You know, I, I don't want to lead you it, but you know, mm. the pharmacist and the doctor. You know, why, why can't we just, just deal with things ourselves? Uh, if you could just address that. So, so, so essentially, um, at the base point, we must, uh, we must understand uh, one thing that when we are talking about Deen and religion, uh, we have a very particular level of. Uh, uh, soundness and authenticity that we need to maintain um, uh, simply because we are talking about wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then it's understanding from it we we can't from our own end uh, put words in there and then as, assume that is the case is, uh, in the in the muqadma of uh, Sahih Muslim uh, Sharif um, uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Sirin rahmullah he had mentioned that in the al madinun that this knowledge that you're trying to acquire, this is this is deen. Then uh, you have to look for where you are taking this knowledge from. Because what's going to happen is that if you're going to take it from Quran and Hadith from Rasulullah and the correct understanding that we have taken out from them, then it is still uh, um, understood to be within the scope of deen. But if you are going to go over to something like uh, internet or, uh, or some general public information, there is a possibility of a doubt that is us, that is all intellectual that's done and that that doesn't have the same level of strength um, uh, we used to uh, like a, um, a statement comes to my mind like uh, before internet we used to think that the lack of general knowledge uh, uh, that, that was due to not having enough information but now we have internet and now we have wikipedia and now we have so much information and yet we are on the same scale that we are not processing the same information and the general knowledge is still completely up, uh, like insignificant among the masses so it shows that the information itself is not sufficient uh, enough to make an informed decision you need to have the right procedure to analyze and uh, process that information along with it as well and for us for example, for for specific uh, field of deen, it is the ulama who 
have who are the heirs of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they, uh, the Hadith Sharif mentioned that the uh, the, uh, the Anbiya do not leave out the dirham uh, and the nanir. Instead, they, they they leave as their inheritance ulum. And that's that's the warasa that that the ulama are taking and exerting their life to acquire a little portion of it in their life so that they can process it and disseminate it further. Absolutely. Now we've we've both used the term alim and ulama. And, you know, sometimes I've used the title sheikh and sometimes mufti. It, it, you know, the general masses to them. And I had this question on on Iqra TV just yesterday. There seems to be different titles and 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 it, you know people sometimes get confused to think. What does that title mean, and what does that title mean? Ulama is a very broad term. Could you just uh, share some titles which signify expertise in particular areas? Yes, uh, for, uh, I mean uh, this uh, this title of giving the ulama generally, from, when we come from the ahadith and the further on from the fuqaha, we realize that the ulama have been mentioned in any 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 individual who have actually uh, spent a considerable amount of time in acquisition of knowledge from the uh, from the correct chain of narration with the proper asanid uh, uh, coming from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they would be considered as the ulama. Uh, a person, for example, Imam Shafi rahmullah. One time he had mentioned how how can I even talk to an, uh, or debate an individual who I have never seen at the doorstep of the ulama, right? And so uh, he may have knowledge, he may have everything, what, what uh, or he may have information about all the hadith and the sciences. I don't need to uh, discuss with him simply because I know he doesn't know how to pursue that information forward on from. So ulama uh, in the earlier time was uh, constructed for specific those scholars who had actually gone out and done the, the, their basis. Then they would be uh, in our time, uh, ulama became more of a like a degree kind of a thing, in, especially on, in our Indian subcontinent area, that where uh, alimia became one of the designation that you you basically do the uh, the courses and that you get the certification of an alim. And uh, this um, had has had uh, pros and its cons. Um, it has it has become fruitful and in some cases it has not been fruitful because you know, just fulfilling the core curriculum uh, a b c d e and then getting a certification does not really really mean that you have connected with that ulum you have actually excelled in that ulum into the depth of it right and uh, and that uh, what we that is what we see generally then now everybody will be called ulama because they have completed that certification when we when a, 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 a scholar comes from like arab background he he has no clue like oh, i'm not an alim but i studied like 15 years right so we, we just call him the sheikh then right so th that difference uh, start to, starts to build up so these terminologies may, may change but once you enter into and you mingle in with the ulama with the uh, with the mashayikh and everything you you realize that they have a, a considerable understanding of a person who has ex spent so much time what kind of a title we are giving into him yes there are some designated titles definitely for example an uh, an alim um, and normally what we understand is any uh, f first level would be imam imam or a uh, hafiz or a maktab teacher when uh, 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 he he would be on the level where he he is addressing the general community uh, issues not necessarily he is going deeper into the academia and uh, beyond that an alim person would have spent a, a considerable like seven to eight years in under a, a, a thorough scholarship or studying getting all the asanid in the hadith and everything so that he can be considered as an alim but um but, uh, and then beyond that you would reach the more tahassus, like a more uh, um, uh, ingrained research level that, uh, into the fiqh of uh, would be a mufti or in the in in the uh, in the hadith sciences, it would be tahassus with hadith or tahassus with tafsir and all those specifications. The, and uh, and they would mention and and just doing the tahassus in tafsir would not make a person a mufassir, right? But but he has gained the expertise of that uh, play, that specific area so that he can utilize it. And, and within the muftis, we have so many different uh, uh, temperaments and mizaj and 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 the uh, the forte of different different academias. A, a mufti who has been excelling in in uh, let's say food matters, right? So he he might be going into uh, uh, the the nutrition science uh, science and all those areas along with his jurisdiction and uh, jurisdiction abilities as as a 
faqih so he will be incorporating that within himself similarly a mufti could could be going into um, uh, other as, uh, 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 astronomical sciences so he would be uh, uh, looking uh, looking at other uh, sciences and utilizing that for making his uh, salah times or or finding out how the moon sighting is working in all those all those areas so these expertise they become the niche within the the, the mufti level and uh, for for uh, for us as laymen as general when we uh, start looking at these mashayikh we need to know what's the expertise of the particular individual because he might be so well ingrained into one per, uh, particular uh, field that he may not be as fluid in the other fields and finally after that mashallah we have uh, uh, qadis who have who have gone uh, a, a step higher to look into how the judicial system uh, works within the islam how the arbitrations and the mediations and all those uh, uh, elements they work out what are the core requirements when taking a statement from somebody whether it's a, a, a wife statement or the husband statement has to be rejected based on what particular uh, criteria and scenario so th these gives us these uh, so many uh, very well defined uh, specialities that when we are asking question to the ulama uh, uh, it becomes like a now a big challenge to actually look out and search for the right person to ask the right question right and and that that gives it gives a um, a good exposure to everyone to fi find many many mashayikh and have them in their contact list if they, if they can get to it absolutely that that's a it'll bring baraka onto the phone uh, mufti faisal sahab just having their names on your contact list um it's and i think on that point you see a lot of people make their decision of ulama based on their local imam and obviously i don't mean no disrespect to to the local imam and imamat imamat is a sunnah it is an established sunnah the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam obviously uh, fulfilled that sunnah to for many years uh, but what i'm saying is is unfortunately because the imam is not necessarily qualifies or spends more time doing tahqiq research uh, he does not necessarily get engaged in uh, fiqh matters that much apart from the basics of salah and siyam and things like that they base the whole ulama uh, fraternity on their interaction interaction with imam sahab or maulana sahab or the maktab teacher uh, and again as i said i'm not saying this in any way belittling the, that role because that role is fundamental uh, uh, for for the establishment of islam uh, and it's on that point, uh, Mufti Faisal, where, uh, you know, we had a query raised about mujtahid. And it's, it, the, the query was raised was that, you know, how can anybody claim to be a mujtahid? But what this brother was confusing with is the necessary ijtihad, which you have sort of alluded to, Mufti Faisal, with regards to new matters, uh, nawazil. You know, these are things which are happening around us 24-7, whether it's cryptocurrency or things like that, you know. There is, there's also ulama, fuqaha who have that level of expertise, Mufti Faisal. Right. So um, there are a lot of contemporary issues and matters in which uh, we, we are basically dumbfounded and stump, uh, stumped uh, because we don't have any nazir or any kind of an, uh, an analogy or something similar coming from the uh, back end. Well, you, you gave the example of uh, uh, bitcoins and cryptocurrencies. And uh, I mean, have, having a wealth that is completely intangible in a sense that it's not even visible to us. Right. So uh, whether to give it some kind of a uh, com commodity level or whether to give it a, a level of a thamani as a currency or something, that's a completely new discussion. And which is why we have giants within the field, even like Mufti Taqi Usmani Thab, and, and uh, spending like all, almost months and then years trying to assess whether we should consider it a currency or not. It's, it's, a, it, it's such a vast field that uh, we don't want to issue something just out of our pocket without any basis because that is completely rejected in, in, in our deen so we need to have a procedure to do it and that that will that may take time and a necessity of of the time that that it needs to be done otherwise the 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 dealings and the interactions and of on a whole scale right now the issue of uh, the way vaccines are going and how we we have been trying to learn the uh, we have basically forced ourselves to learn the the, the the actual working of the vaccine how the mrna is going to work about and uh, how the replication is taking
taking place what is the original and the, what is the progeny and uh, 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 of these vaccines and everything we, we are learning all those things with the help of of the experts of the field so that we can uh, push our mental capacity to uh, come to a conclusion and it will be very very unfair to to a religious sciences to completely say that we are not going to uh, do any of this kind of an uh, exertion uh, in ishtihad in these avenues simply because the door for ishtihad is closed right the, these elements will come up they will keep on coming up and uh, the, the only uh, structure we have is the matters on which the previous ishtihads have been done that has been done and closed right so we are not going to reopen them to reassess them because we don't have that kind of a, a, a solid capacity to do that what the aima they, ha they have done before but the new matters they, which are coming we don't have any information from uh, from our pious uh, elders pious predecessors so we are going to try to do the best that we can with the, with the information that we have available and uh, push ourselves to gain more and more information and so th this process will definitely continue and there are mashayikh mashallah I, I i i consider you to be among alhamdulillah uh, as, as as such a source that i can always go to and ask ab about these issues so that i can i can uh, work out um, most of the time like mufti taqi usmani sahab is there uh, we, uh, we have alhamdulillah my teacher mufti ibrahim desai he is very very particular and meticulous about uh, not leaving any any aspect of a, 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 a new matter completely void he always looks into it even if it goes against his previous uh, uh, previous fatawas or previous stances and everything he does not he does not uh, stop at that he, he keeps on going and that is required in academia that's academic integrity and uh, honesty uh, that we must continue to strive towards that so that's quite clear and i think i hope everybody's been able to take that on board that the concept and practice of ijtihad will continue until the end of days uh, that is a necessary fundamental tool in the toolbox of the fuqaha in order to make <laughs> Islam and the Sharia relevant to us in all times, in all scenarios, in all cultures. And to suggest that that's, that's over, then that's, that's a non-entity. And I think, as Mufti Faisal has explained, people get what are matters of non-ijtihad confused. Like, for example, no one is going to make ijtihad about, you know, what is a nullifier of wudu. Khalas, that's been done. The doors closed. We're not going to reanalyze those ahadith. Fantastic. Alhamdulillah. So we, I think we've really established about uh, who the ulama are and who we should um, be asking. Musa, this if, if I could just mention one more point. Sure. Um, one final point about this is that, so just so that people uh, don't have that doubt within them, um, is the aspect of a collective ishtihad, right? The, uh, uh, we, we have not discussed that or uh, alluded to that. A, a single individual making, making an ishtihad in these contemporary issues has a possibility, a large possibility of making a, a mistake. So, uh, the, which is why we, uh, in our times, what we refer as collective ishtihad, that we look at as a general uh, populace of the muftiyan or the scholars or the, uh, uh, the experts in the field, they, if they collectively uh, do their ishtihad and they come to a conclusion which conforms to itself, then we are uh, reasonably uh, secure and safe that this, uh, the, uh, the margin of error in this is much less. So we are going to prefer that over a single opinion of one individual that may come. Yeah, that, that, per, uh, that particular scholar and the uh, and, uh, reputable uh, researcher, he may hold his opinion because that is his own exertion. But as a general practice, we are going to side with the, uh, the majority uh, who have been excelling in it. Uh, absolutely, that's a good distinction to make uh, because I, I think it's a slightly complicated matter. But again, if I just add to what Mufti Faisal said is that when an individual faqih is, 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 is practicing ijtihad, then his position that he comes to through exerting his intellectual efforts does become somewhat binding on him because his heart is telling him this is sound. However, when it comes to uh, Joe Public, the, 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 the masses, then they shouldn't be looking at isolated views unless obviously that they're connected to a particular scholar uh, and they take his views all the time. Uh, otherwise, then when they should look for a group's uh, jama of ulama and see what position that jama of ulama is giving. Okay, great to add that in. I, I think we're, we're, we're happy now, uh, Mufti Faisal, to move on a little bit and now start to explore, you know, what to ask. Okay, we, we know who the ulama are, alhamdulillah. Uh, we know who to ask. We've looked at the different gradations and expertise within the ulama fraternity. 
uh, and also the different roles. Sometimes people, and I'm glad you touched upon that, sometimes people can't discern and differentiate between fatwa and qada. They think that they're the, both the same thing. So, you know, I'm sure Mufti Faisal gets the same kind of queries that I do, where a sister will write in and says, my husband does X, Y, Z, A, B, Z. And the, the scholar will act as a mufti. So he will say, in those circumstances, uh, you're, you are divorced. And then the husband will ring and says, well, I never said these things. That doesn't matter. The mufti is responding to the query, not seeking out the truth. Whereas a Qazi's job would be to actually bring the parties. So sometimes we don't know what to ask, but you know, uh, oh, in what way to ask. And I think that's what leads us now, uh, Mufti uh, uh, Faisal Saab, about what to ask, okay? How do we go about asking a question? You know, there's so many platforms now, you know, WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, uh, you know, uh, Twitter and all the rest of it. How, how should we ask, you know, I remember, you know, when I was growing up, which, you know, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's people on here sort of my age, you know, there would be a way we would go to the masjid, we would find out what particular time Mufti Saab was free. You know, we knew that between Asr time and whatever time he was normally doing his own muamalat, so we could go there. We would sit not uh, next to him. We would sit in his eye shot, but not come near him and sit there until he himself called us over. We would then go over. We would sit literally kind of kneecap to kneecap. We would uh, give salam. We would ask the Mufti how he is, and then we would uh, pose the question with some level other times of move on Mufti Faisal Saab. Are we still going to do it I, like that? And I am I'm completely in agreement with you. I mean, it's uh, it, not too long ago. I, I still remember in South Africa when I, when I had to ask question from Mufti Ibrahim Desai Saab uh, while as a student over there, uh, and I noticed that he's talking to another teacher. I know that oh, I have to stand about like ten, uh, five to ten feet away and, and not to eavesdrop into his conversation. But while at the same time making sure that he looks at me so he knows that I'm waiting for him. So yes, definitely. I mean, those 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 elements are definitely there, but with a very in within a very confined circles of those who actually know about these etiquettes of uh, or or the proper adab to approach the the fuqaha and just no, so as not to uh, put them into the position or anything like that in our times and many things have changed many things are changing but uh, at the same time the etiquettes and the adab also they they uh, they should be amended accordingly simply because uh, the the mufti is on your whatsapp uh, call or whatsapp number it's it's not a sufficient reason for you to just bombard him for 12, 12, 13 different questions and then expect him to answer within two hours, right? It's, it's, it's just, it cannot uh, happen. So um, we must, uh, uh, from our customary or free sense, we must lay out what, what the proper adab and etiquettes would be. And before even asking the question, and, um, we, we need to make this, uh, the, um, the laity, the layman, the, the general populace who, are, who, are, who want to ask the question, uh, them aware that, that before even you open your your mouth and ask the question you need to first work on upon yourself whether you are doing it for the right reasons or not whether the intention there and the sincerity is there that you are actually approaching the mufti or the scholar or the imam or whoever it is whether you are doing it for the for the purpose of actually acquiring an, uh, an answer that you will practice upon because most of the times um once, uh, once uh, one uncle had asked me a question right after the salah. Um, uh, it was a masjid in which the main imam, he was an academic uh, mufti himself. The imam himself was an academic mufti, but this uh, one of the congregants, he comes, in, uh, comes to me and asks me, what is your opinion about this particular issue? I say, like, you are in a masjid whose uh, uh, imam is a thorough, he teaches in a madrasa on a higher level. Why don't you go and ask him? Right, he's your he's your imam, he's your mufti. So he said, like, Oh, I know what Mufti Sahib's opinion is. I want to know what your answer is. Right. So sometimes uh, we do get approached and ask these questions and bluntly in the manner that as if we are being tested. Right. Uh, so this this is not the right way of, of uh, approaching or uh, the right intention or the sincerity. What should be there is you are you are asking a question to fulfill the mandate of fasalu ahla dikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. If you do not know, then you are asking the person of knowledge. But if you already know, uh, you have made your mind, and now you are asking the question just to see how deep can Mufti Sahib answer, then uh, obviously you will be questioned about it. The Mufti Sahib will not be questioned about it. Right. So uh, you. Uh, 
first key is make the intention and your sincerity in check that I'm asking the question so that I can fulfill upon the answer, whatever the Mufti Sahib is going to give. If your reliance on that Mufti is not sufficient enough that you're not going to act upon it, then please don't waste that time of that Mufti. <laughs> Let him answer to somebody else who, who has such good taluk that he is going to follow whatever the Mufti is going to give him. So these are, they are, uh, these are primary things that a person can, uh, should do. Up until now, we had been discussing from the side of the ulama, but from the side of the uh, people themselves, they need to know that it's uh, they have a journey and a and a, um, a, a, a job to play in the entire journey or life of is as a Muslim as well. They have to make sure their uh, uh, sincerity and everything is in check while they are approaching. Is their question a viable question or not? Um, an incident comes about Imam Abu Yusuf Rahmullah when he was sitting in a in a, in a gathering and and um, um, he was advising them that uh, that uh, haya in the uh, in the aspect of um, asking questions of deen and everything uh, you you should worry about asking the question and not worry about the haya so uh, so one person one individual was sitting silently over there and uh, and Imam Abu Yusuf was explaining that the uh, the psalm is going to be from the tulu al fajr from the dawn until the uh, sunset right so the the, quest, uh, the the silent individual sitting in there he uh, he said like uh, what if the sun doesn't set right now in our times that may be the case in that up, uh, higher up north uh, norway and all those areas where the sun actually doesn't set that might be a valid question but in their times i mean that's unthinkable why would the sun not set so imam yusuf's retort and reply to him was you are better quiet right it, it, it is better for you to um uh, stay quiet rather than to ask a question that doesn't make sense does, it doesn't hold any weight yes in our times we will we will say yeah questioning is not bad you can go ahead and ask whatever question but make sure it's not a question that is just for the sake of verbal exercise or intellectual exercise for no reason right so uh, so those things must be taken uh, um, taken seriously because because you asking a question is an ibadah him answering the question is an ibadah and uh, fulfill, fulfilling and acting upon it, that is also an ibadah. So it's, it's an ibadah, we cannot just play around with that, this ibadah just like that. Right? And once we, once we do all that, then you would realize that many of the muftis, they, they know as soon as your question starts, whether the question is posed with the correct intention or not. Many a times I, I have seen that a question would be asked and, and uh, mufti sahib would give a very small answer. I'm talking about Mufti Ibrahim Desai Sahib. The question is asked and Mufti Sahib would say like, do it like this. And he doesn't explain anything else. And the, and, and the Sa'il, the questioner, he says, Jazakallah khair Mufti Sahib, you have so solved the problem for me. And Mufti Sahib would make dua for him that, that he had asked the question, got the answer, and now his life is set for on, the, on that particular matter. Right? Whereas on the other end, uh, you, may be, uh, ask, you may be asked a question and within a few seconds, you will see the Mufti rolling his eyes. Because he knows like, oh, this is a long drawn question just for the sake of question and not really for the asking the question at all. So these, these are basic things that we should look forward to when we are approaching all those mashayikh. In, in, when, you, when we go to the masjid and everything, when we meet them in person, yes, definitely all the etiquettes that we have, we have mentioned with regards to approaching the ulama, they must be maintained. The, the, the caliber of the scholars and the caliber of the ulum that is within the hearts of these scholars, we must maintain the respect for it. And that caliber, uh, although you may not be fully able to express on these internet, on the on zoom and on the whatsapp and all these places but still you can show that that your zeal and desire comes out with a respect right and i have been asked question at times um that uh, mufti sahib what what is the mandate with regards to this and i give them the answer and they say like, no no i'm not asking your opinion i'm asking what the quran and hadith says about it right so suddenly right away the mufti is going to say like okay uh, 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 here is the link for the quran and here is the link for the hadith go ahead and check it out Right. If you're not relying on me, then it's it's a give and take. You you come to me because I give an example of you know siphoning out the 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 gas from the car, 
right? You always have to put yourself down. You have to humble yourself in order for the oil to come down. The bucket has to go down lower, lower than the actual petrol. Please don't do this it's <laughs> to anyone else's car. Don't steal the, the gas and everything. But in Ulum also, you have to raise the, the, the hearts and raise the level of, uh, of the scholars and put yourself down so you the, the knowledge can pour down into your heart. That's the only way you're going to get the answers. Uh, Brother Ahmed, I can see your hand up. We're just going to uh, have another sort of 10 minutes or so with, with the other aspect of the question. And then, inshallah, we will be opening up for, for Q&A. So please, if you could write your question down in case it may slip your mind. Uh, and then, inshallah, we will, we will take, take them on board. Uh, just to come back to you, Amuf Vesel, on that particular point, three key points that you know come to my mind as well. One is, obviously, the fact that you are asking this question so that you can go act on it. That's absolutely essential at this, that you're not asking the question for any other reason, but because you need to go act upon it. That's point number one, which is absolutely essential. Point number two is that if you already knew the answer, then there's no point asking the Mufti sir. For instance, just as Mufti alluded to there, I, I get queries like that where, please give me evidence for the opinion you're gonna express, all right? So you say, okay, in what form would you like this uh, evidence? Um, well, you know, give me hadith and ayat of the Quran. Okay, uh, do you understand Arabic? No, I don't. Okay, so what are you going to do with the, with the Arabic hadith and the Arabic uh, Quran? Uh, I want you to translate it then. Okay, so are you are you Hafiz of of uh, of Quran? No, I'm not. Okay, so are you Hafiz or are you a muhadith? Have you memorized all of Bukhari? Have you memorized all of Muslim, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, Bayhaqi? Uh, so, you know all these uh, hadith books. No, I haven't. So you want me to take an Arabic bit of text which you don't understand and you don't know whether it's in Bukhari or not? Or I'm just going to write Bukhari at the end of it. You, I'm going to take some Arabic, which you think is coming from the Quran, which it may not come from. And then you want me to translate that for you in English and you can't understand Arabic, so it might, it's my translation anyway. So you can see the folly in all of this. If you've gone to a particular scholar to ask the question, then please accept the answer that he provides. Absolutely. Okay, last section, uh, um, before, we, uh, before we open up to some Q&A, is, um, is the manner of asking. I think we've already kind of touched upon it, but I'm, I'm talking more specifically now about the style of the question, not necessarily the adab of, of how we approach the shiuch. And it's, you know, the value of ilm is the way the person approaches uh, ulama. The person who values ilm, when he knows that this scholar is going to give a piece of gold to him, then the way he will approach this uh, owner of gold is, is with respect, with awe. If you do not value what, what, what information or what knowledge is being shared with you, then your approach will obviously demonstrate that. This is absolutely essential. Uh, I make the point that respect is not something that person has to earn. Respect is something that you have and it's how you demonstrate it. Um, that's, you know, the, so, so that's key. So how, how would we go about asking? Uh, what how, kind of, how do we pose our question? What, what's the best ways for mm -hmm. that? If you can just uh, mm -hmm. uh, articulate a few things, the kind of general do's and don'ts, uh, things right. of that nature, uh, before we then open up, inshallah, for, for Q&A. Right. So let's uh, let's keep in mind that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned uh, that husna sawal in this min al al um, that the the mannerism and the 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 good way of articulating the question uh, is going to form the basis and the foundation of uh, your your entirety of your knowledge simply because that's going to lay the foundation that you do not know so you are asking in uh, in the humble manner so that you can you will gain the knowledge and you will act upon it that's going to be the completion perfection of your knowledge so obviously we need to know how to pose that question and what what uh, general do's and don'ts would, would be applied over there right in, in um, you have to first assess the mode of uh, asking the question if you're ask, asking the question in person then obviously you you need to in, in inculcate the ihtaram the the way in the, the tone of your voice and everything must be kept in mind and present the question with the actual or factual information that the the, the uh, mufti is going to uh, utilize for the answer rather rather than giving him a vague 
sense of question um, and then expecting the mufti sahab to uh, insinuate or assume uh, different angles from it so uh, uh, you need to keep that in mind before that approaching the mufti sahab uh, uh, we should uh, uh, one of the big do's is that uh, you always approach him knowing that he has a lot of uh, uh, duties and a lot of uh, 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 time that is being set aside for different activities so send in a request beforehand mufti sahab i have a very small question if you can just give me two two three minutes right and make sure that it is two three minutes the, uh, or if it is it requires a, a lengthy discussion then you, uh, what what i normally suggest is send in a message uh, to the mufti stating that i have a problem with this particular method uh, particular issue i would like you to tell me how should i approach it should i write, uh, send you a voice note should i write it down for you or uh, uh, would you like to meet me in person and let the mufti de decide for you that how is going to many a times we we get similar questions which uh, the questioner may seem like it's a long drawn 15 20 minutes question at least right whereas the answer is just simple uh, one or two minutes right? so uh, once you tell the uh, sheikh like oh this is the subject matter i wish to discuss that the the sheikh may say like okay send me send me the voice note uh, uh, make it make it like three minutes right and send him that that voice note and he uh, the mufti might give you the full detail in his voice a voice reply and you will not have to worry about asking the question again uh, but if you realize no you need to give more information and uh, mufti sahab doesn't know this particular information here so my uh, advice normally is all, all these matters of like for example talaq for example marital dispute and all these issues write it down these are not the matters that that you are going to give answer on the fly so you write it down exact wordings for example a question came to me i i i told him like and he he was uh, telling me that he has been fighting with his wife quite a bit arguing a lot so i told him do me a favor go home sit down uh, and start writing down all the statements you might have said to your wife because your question is coming about uh, with regards to talaq so i need to know all the statements all the context of the fight and the argumentation or discussion with that you have done and you come with me and he comes uh, mashallah he he goes back and he comes back with the two pages of different different things and alhamdulillah none of them were ever actually talaq right so uh, and he has been sitting with the waswasa or the or the doubt for for considerable time all he had to do was sit down and chart it out the facts of the matter and send it over to the to, to the mufti to, for the review so many times uh, this is this is taken care uh, we have to keep in mind uh, question and answers are different types so some questions are, uh, may require a very quick answer some question requires a, a research even if the question may seem very simple one Uh, i'm using this particular um nail polish does it void my wudu or not right now we uh, uh, muftis are not looking into the nail polishes and trying to figure out what, uh, what kind of new cosmetic trends are coming along so uh, they may have to say okay let, uh, we, this is a research worthy issue whether that particular nail polish is uh, porous enough to let the water go down properly or not so we are going to do testings with that so be, be patient with it uh, uh, when you send in the query and think uh, uh, that it's it's it's, a, it's going to require time give it like a good few weeks to, Uh, sometimes right and in some small cases it may require maybe 24 hours you'll get the answers within the 24 hours in some cases maybe 2 to 3 days that's general right any question that you normally send to a mufti expect an answer in 3 days because because he may be backlogged with other questions as well right so he may get to you in, in due time but give give that certain time when you are posing your your, your question uh, to him make make sure you are mentioning that i uh, i had this issue if you had any discussion with another scholar on the particular aspect and got a answer which you are practicing on mention that clearly that this is the answer i received and, and this is the new information that has come up and, uh, do i do i need to continue my practice on the previous answer or do i need to revise this or not once you are cl clear in in the way you are asking your questions you would realize that the answer for the mufti is going to become very easy and sometimes it's going to come very very fast as well because he's got all the facts in in mind Right. and I, i received a, a question uh, somebody somebody uh, asked me a question about um, a particular issue vaguely mentioning the matter right 
this is the case and this is this is what's happening and i'm thinking like there are about like five or six different cases six secret different angles that could have happened so i sent them a reply i say like i need more clarification what are the particulars in this particular case which angle did uh, did certain uh, uh, element happen and they say like that's that's too much of an uh, inappropriate personal information that you are asking and, uh, and and i replied i'm not asking for my pleasure or something like that i'm asking to answer your question you need to provide me this factual information that i need in order for for me to progress other than uh, uh, if that's not there then i will not be able to follow suit i always get the ones which is uh, i've got a quick question uh, <laughs> it's never quick and, and my response is my response is i've got a long answer <laughs> so the sometimes the answer, finding the answer takes a lot longer than the question the questions are usually quite quick uh but seeking those answers can take hours and days sometimes uh, and it's also like you touched upon there is the schedules that ulama have and mm. and the more uh, alhamdulillah Allah that takes work from them the busier they get you know they they usually husbands and and fathers and and then they have a role in the community their own community whether they are you know teachers whether they're imams uh, and then obviously they've got to earn a living as well and then they have other responsibilities and they can be dealing with queries you know as late as 12 one o'clock in the morning and start dealing with queries again from the next the next morning you know they try to be as available as possible so for the kind of more structured questions we're now going to move on to questions from uh, uh, panelists or participants or whatever the phrase is uh, but rather than everybody sort of uh, uh, just asking questions which will get difficult to manage uh, if you can't put your hand up like uh, Brother Ahmed, who's been very patient, mashallah, has had his hand up, and then that will make life easier for me uh, just to go to that particular person. So, uh, Ahmed Bai, if you would like to uh, pose your question to Mufti Faisal, sir. I think you're muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself? or? Yeah, unmute? sorry. I, I was trying to press mute uh, and it wouldn't allow me to, but there you go. I hope you can hear me. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah. And I'm just sorry, yourself. It was a negative sighting, unfortunately. <laughs> no um, my question, my question is, is uh, you know, my Ustad, uh, you know, in my teenage years, always uh, said one thing as we left our maktab was, in life, you will always need to refer uh, to learned uh, individuals, and um, and it, and it's important that you keep hold of one particular individual who you entrust. Now, sadly, uh, because some ulama are name and shamed and, and things like this, you know, it becomes very difficult for the lay Muslim like myself uh, to actually um, to, to know as to who to approach, for example. Now, I personally haven't been in that position where I've had to actually ask for a fatwa from an individual basis. Mm -hmm. However, I did approach a Darul Iftar locally uh, for some interest uh, money related issues in regards to charity. And that was signed by four learned people uh, as part of that Darul Iftar Darul Um set up. So I think my question here is basically as to which individuals do yourself or the Qali Sahib recommend for the lay Muslim to go to in respect to uh, being the mujtahid? I know that you did a very long uh, video, didn't you? Uh, audio clip of the Amjad. So uh, sorry to bring that point up, but, uh, but I think it's a key question nonetheless, I think. So that mus uh, Muslim uh, individuals, uh, not just for today, but for our future generations, who we can entrust essentially. So Mufti Faisal Saab, I'm going to throw that one right on you. Uh, you. Good old Bradfordian style. So uh, the question, if you didn't catch it, was um, who do we see as our uh, kind of pioneering ulama, if that's for want of a better word, uh, those who are on the kind of edges of looking at contemporary matters, contemporary issues, uh, who should we entrust our affairs to, uh, Mufti Faisal? Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, inshallah, I mean, this this obviously will change depending on the location, depending on uh, where you are. Um, it's a it's a very good thing that that you have something like a wifa a central a central place where uh, a question can be asked uh, uh, now. Mm, what I would suggest is every individual uh, out of his own should always keep a, a journal of him, for himself, a, a diary for, him, for himself for the, with the context of the mashayikh that he, they come up and meet up to. Um, 
many a times you may not know the particular individuals of this expert of the particular field. So you can uh, ask the, uh, the, the, the central organization, something like Vifakur Ulama, that I have a question with regala, uh, regards to Islamic finance, or I have a question with regards to economics or uh, uh, some, uh, some bare tra transaction or something, and I need to get uh, uh, complete clarity on the issue. And if the Vifak does not have a local in-house uh, uh, mufti who can address that, they will assign or uh, uh, you or they will let you know who who should uh, who you can actually relate to uh, to get these answers uh, alhamdulillah uk is much more structured than than we what we have in canada where in canada uh, we are still in the in a, in a much uh, darker ages of of these kind of uh, situations where you have no clue so uh, central organizations are very few very very few maybe one or two so uh, hence a general idea Everywhere else is going to be like that as well. Not every place is going to be like as structured as UK uh, in, the, in these cases. So I would suggest keep a journal and keep, keep a follow up of uh, who you are uh, contacting with regards to particular expertise, whether it's Islamic finance or whether it's in, in something like a food matter. Um, no, uh, as, as long as you have one or two uh, relied upon um, um, scholars of a particular field, that's, that's good enough for you to rely upon them and ask them the question questions about it. Um beyond that once you have this kind of a journal and you keep on following it up with with questions you would get more and more information and get comfortable with uh, who the contemporaries of that particular uh, scholar may be right and and uh, who he relies upon or who he recommends and then you can you can build up on that and get more and more scholars within your ambits it will take time but as i said it's a journey of life that as long as you are sincere the the, the journey is going to pay off uh, I have one which has been sent to me uh, uh, while somebody is uh, uh, typing here. Uh, uh, for in a dispute between two people, so uh, the question obviously is not taking into consideration that this will be a matter of qadha, but okay, let's carry on. In a dispute between two people, person A goes to Mufti A and person B goes to Mufti B, I suppose, and the answers from the two Muftis are opposing. How would such a uh, situation be resolved? Right. So, um, yeah, it, it may not enter into a qada, but, uh, but at the same time, some of the rules may, may still apply in the same way. Um, I remember uh, about three years ago, I did write a, a small article about a general guide, guidance in finding the right mufti to ask the fatwa. It's on, on my blog on kafla.org, which actually mentioned when, when, when you, you get responses from uh, different muftis in a different manners, how do you reconcile between them or what path you should uh, take. Now in disputes, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult matter uh, because if you are doing a kind of an arbitration in between two individuals or uh, they are fighting with each other, the chance are the, the, the person is only going to accept the, the, the fatwa of the mufti that, that uh, sides with him or her. All right. So uh, in, in that case, uh, what I normally would suggest is actually seek out an arbitration rather, rather than just getting the uh, uh, a, fatwa, a fatwa from a mufti because that's going to continue. Uh, uh, the skirmish is going to keep on continuing. In an arbitration, what's, what's going to happen is it's not a single uh, scholar, rather a panel of scholars are going to sit in as, as, as a uh, um, as, as a personnel to seek, uh, uh, judge your, your issue and marital or, or dispute or anything, and then resolve the matter by giving a verdict. Right. So these these should be themselves, mashallah, like like or uh, some some well ingrained muftiyan to have the, the insight into the qada system and everything. They will carry out an arbitration, and there you will get one answer that basically covers everything, rather than uh, getting multiple different answers from two different uh, three different uh, areas and then trying to pit them uh, against each other. Right. So so that that's a resolution uh, in this particular case. If the issue is about a general matter. Then, then uh, th there are ways of reconciling. Always opting for the caution and uh, always remembering that the purpose is is not to usurp another person's haq, another person's right, uh, and uh, 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 making Allah subhanahu wa taala happy. So in that case, many a times a resolution will uh, uh, a reconciliation would be that you just give in and uh, allow the matter to resolve properly. Uh, absolutely, I, I echo Mufti Faisal's comments there. With regards to this, it would be. Uh a matter of uh, uh, agreeing on a particular scholar, both parties agreeing on that particular scholar 
if a, a group of scholar or a panel of scholars are not available, there's no structure that exists within the local community. Once they have both parties have agreed, this is obviously before they've sought a position from him, because as again, Mufti Faisal said that once you sort a position, they're obviously going to be inclined to go to the one that you feel favors your position. So once that person has been selected, then that matter should be put to them, inshallah. Uh, we've got a few questions which have come on uh, on the um, chat. Uh, so I'm going to read them out to you, Mufti Faisal Saab. Uh, um, so it, this seems to be uh, a group of three. So allow me to present all three and, uh, and then that will give you some context. Uh, what if our question isn't answered? Uh, should we pursue it and how diligently should we do so? Uh, two, from the same person, uh, which so it may be related. What if our, also, what if our question is posed on a public platform and we receive replies from others? I'm assuming what she means by others are non-scholars, but let's carry on. Uh, number three, lastly, what if our question, which was posed in public, replies from others accusing us of not being sincere or of being disrespectful to the scholar. Ah, she mentions who others are. Others who are not scholars, okay? Or at least as the questioner thinks that they're not scholars. So in case I've uh, confused you, uh, let me just- No, let me I just have repeat. the chat in front of you. You got it, have, or you watch yes. it, okay. Bismillah. Okay. All right, so, so I'll answer the first question first. So what if our questions uh, isn't answered? Should we pursue uh, and how diligently? I always uh, suggest that always keep a keep a regular schedule. Uh, when you send a question into the Mufti, um, especially on WhatsApp or on these places, is very, very uh, common that the, uh, the question just gets buried into multiple different uh, communications and he, the, uh, the Sheikh doesn't get to see it at all. Right. So, or sometimes he sees it, but he, he wants to reply it at a later stage when he's more calm and just forgets about it because, because there are too many things. So, yes, do uh, um, remind uh, the Mashaikh, uh, maybe after uh, like a, a three days uh, difference, just, uh, just a kind reminder. Right? Don't come out as uh, pressing them to seek a response that uh, as if you're demanding it. Don't demand the response. The, uh, inshallah, the, every sheikh, every mufti who's, who's answering the question, doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so they, they are willing to answer. It's just that sometimes they, uh, they get sidetracked with all the other duties. So remind them every three days. Or if the, uh, the sheikh tells you, you don't have to remind me, I'm actually working on it. Then keep a bigger buffer of going perhaps maybe like uh, uh, two, two weeks uh, or three weeks and then send a reminder Mufti Saab in case you forgot pl uh, please um, in, in case you forgot then please uh, please respond to it as well right so this would be the first one I do remind but with a reasonable assurance and not, not just demanding something um, as quick as possible so uh, remember that I have sometimes waited uh, literally years to get my questions resolved with the mashayikh so it, 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 it is not wrong you can keep on working towards it the second question that you asked was what if our question is posed in a public platform uh, which I'm assuming something like a WhatsApp group or something where there are ulamas and non-ulamas now, and we st you start receiving replies from others. Uh, as long as the other mashayikh who are on uh, other uh, people who are answering are mashayikh, then that is reasonable to accept uh, their answer for the question. But if a non-ulama are replying, as long as they are um, uh, uh, not, uh, as as long as they uh, they are making nakal, like they are just uh, giving you a fatwa by a scholar. Which, which they have asked beforehand and they come to know of it and they're just posting that with the reference to the particular scholar that I, I asked this question to this scholar and this is their answer. Then that, that is acceptable. However, generally, do, uh, do not just accept the answer from the non-olamas because they don't understand the nuances of uh, structuring uh, uh, structuring an answer uh, which which would cause problems uh, your last question if other people think that uh, you are being insincere in uh, or disrespectful in answering uh, assess yourself introspect yourself and uh, check whether your wordings are that of uh, respect or not respect. Sometimes our tone, uh, because it's a two dimensional uh, in interaction on a chat or a talking, uh, it may seem uh, void of any respect. So uh, inculcate the, uh, your uh, your respect in there, I I even as simple as calling a, uh, calling a sheikh with a mufti sahab or a, a respected sheikh, even that brings in a little bit of a, a respect into the statement. And you don't have to say like a oh, brother so so give me the answer, right? Some uh, that the, the tone will will depend. But 
if as long as you assess that there is no disrespect, your intention in uh, inward, uh, you are sincere, then you don't need to worry about other, what other people think, think about your approach to the sheikh. Okay, Mufti Faisal, I've jumped on my laptop, just froze on me, not sure why. So I'm now on my iPad. Unfortunately, obviously, I've lost all the chat. Uh, oh, there was a question. I, yes, the, I, I can see the question. I, I can read it out. Maybe you can answer this one then. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Let's flip. <laughs> How can we determine which ulama are reliable since we are deviated? There are deviated ulama as well. Uh, we, the general masses, don't know how to distinguish that. So how can that be determined, uh, uh, the, the reliability of the ulama, that is? Okay, Bismillah. Usually that used to be easy. Reason why it used to be easy, it was because we could spend time with that scholar. So, for instance, you would normally meet him in the masjid. You would be able to look at his etiquettes, his practice, his amal, his behavior. Does he smile? Is he you know, overly aggressive? Do you see the sunnah in him? That, that's in essence what you're looking for. And if you saw the sunnah in him, his behavior, his mannerisms, I'm not necessarily just speaking about the, the, the sunnah in terms of actions and behavior. I'm speaking more about the sunnah of akhlaq. And if you saw that in him and you saw that he was a, a man who possessed ilm, he, he had a response and the response obviously was, was accepted. Uh, you then got to look at the ulama fraternity. And remember, this is something we, you know, we refer to as kubuliyat. Kubuliyat is something which when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes somebody and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only likes people because they're near him, uh, when he likes them, then he calls Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says to Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, that I love so-and-so, you know, make an announcement. Uh, so Jibreel alayhi salam makes an announcement in the heavens and, and the announcement in the, on, on the earth until people start to love and respect uh, uh, him. Now, as I said, you want to draw the distinction between, you know, anybody and everybody, because you can see, you know, if you went on to, say, uh, Twitter or something, you'd find that the celebrities have got the biggest followers, you know, whether they're football stars, pop stars or, or movie stars. So that doesn't necessarily mean that when you have a large following, uh, that that means that this person is of repute and, and should be followed. But rather it is the ulama themselves, those highly regarded ulama, that respect this individual. So if it's a, a group of ulama, a jama, uh, and they have obviously regarded this, this one or two or five or 10 people respectful, then that is your kind of criteria. So, you know, that, that's the best criteria that you can make of a person in terms of determining uh, who is the, the, the person to follow, who is the right scholar, who is not the right scholar. I guess the only way you could do that now with, with social media is probably following that person on social media. But remember, that only gives you a small glimpse of what that person is like. It doesn't necessarily give him all the, 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 the sort of aspects of him. You know, a person's wife will know the man far better than anybody else. A person's children will know the man far better than anyone else. Now, it's very difficult, as I said, to be able to do that level of uh, analysis or observation. Uh, back in the day, that, that was more possible. Now, obviously, because we're always reaching out, uh, then that's not so. So the other way would be is that, you know, who are determining our salah times? Who are we going to for when it comes to our zakat? Who are we going to when it comes to these kind of issues? So when it comes to these kind of issues, and if we trust or have entrusted the ulama with these sorts of responsibilities, then we would ex expect or rather accept the other things which come with them as well. Remember, you are only held accountable to the best of your knowledge. So if you've made effort, you know, then that would suffice. You know, even if you unfortunately ended up with somebody who isn't of that nature. Uh, and remember, this is also the, the goal of life, isn't it? You know, diamonds aren't found on top of the roads. Diamonds are found buried away. So this is, you know, when you want to seek guidance, then obviously guidance is going to come from ulama. It's not that guidance is going to come. Uh, obviously, guidance comes from Allah, but the the suburb, the, the means of it is through the rightly guided ulama. So we got to also make dua to Allah that Ya Allah guide us, guide us to ulama of, of sound repute, sound learning, sound aqaid, sound practice, so that they may guide us. And that, that's, that's one way, inshallah.
Mutsab, if, if I may uh, add uh, a point over there, Mashallah, sure. excellent point with regards to the di diamond aspect, because I, I, I still remember almost about like maybe 12 years ago, I asked Mufti Ibrahim this, I want, uh, this question. I can still remember I was sitting in a car next to him and um, uh, I asked him that, that I fear that, that uh, knowing too many ulama on a very personal level as well, I, uh, I sometimes tend to fall into uh, speculative aspect of it, whether, whether these are genuine ulama or not genuine ulama, which one of them are the waliullahs and which one are not. And he said, like, you remember uh, that, that uh, about the same thing, that the diamonds, uh, in a, if, if you place a diamond inside a bowl with the other, other uh, cubic zirconias, right, it's just small stones, then the diamond is still in there. In order to find the diamond, you would still have to go into the same bowl, right? So you, you can't look for the diamond elsewhere, right? So uh, in, in this, what you need to do is, um, as is the case with majority of the, uh, the, the ummah within uh, of Muhammad, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we only go to ulama when, when the matters become really tough. Right? We, we normally don't keep a contact with the ulama. So the, the time when they're coming and asking for the ulama, it's, it's really some harsh manner or harsh problem that they're facing. So what I suggest in those cases is re have reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put the effort in, make istikhara. Right? Seek khair from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you put your uh, whole energy into it and find the right scholar to, to ask for it, even if it turns out that the person is not the, on the right uh, methodology or anything, you are still asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put khair in it. And Allah will make sure that the, uh, the right answer come over, comes over to you because your desire was sincere towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely. And this is that tawfiq that we speak of, you know, uh, we, we are sitting here as scholars, Mufti Faisal and I, uh, but we, we, we are also unworthy students. So, you know, we also had to make similar du'as. We also had to seek, uh, you know, we had to travel. We had to look for people. And, you know, we may have had experiences with our teachers or some of our teachers, which we may not have been really happy or impressed about. And there may have been certain teachers which have left such a profound impact upon us that arguably, you know, we reflect a lot of their, uh, styles and skills. So this is a process of life. You know, we are all on it just because a certain person is a mufti or a maulana or a sheikh. At the end of the day, when we're buried, we're not going to have those titles. It's just going to be Amjid Muhammad or whatever, whatever. So really the case is, is that we're all on the same journey and we're obviously uh, pushing ahead in order to uh, reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best way possible. So when we can answer questions, then we will. But when questions come to us as beyond us, then we will take mashwara, we will discuss, we will debate whether with our contemporaries, with our peers, uh, and in order to reach that answer. Again, we cannot say that we have reached the answer or have not reached the answer, but that's the effort and that's the fact. You remember, Jannah is not cheap, okay? Jannah is gonna take some, some effort there, inshallah. Um, so I don't know if, it, I've just got, I think that's what I meant to ask too. Uh, so I'm missing something before this uh, as well on the chat, Mufti. Uh, uh, Faisal, can you can you get the chat just before this says? I think yes, uh, I have a question here from Brother Abu Isa, but uh, this question I think it's a, a, a specific key question, which would not be the scope of our discussion at the moment. Talking about drop sourcing, uh, no, no, drop just, shipping, just, uh, drop shipping just, right? Just before that, Sheikh, the, if you uh, go that first, was uh, that was Brother Ilm Seeker just sharing the uh, same uh, and the one article. before and the, and the one before that. Uh, Brother Ab Ahmad said that his question was the same as Brother Abdul Samad. Which uh, he was asking did, about I the don't have brother Abdul Samad's question. What was brother? Yeah, that, that was uh, it was about the uh, uh, gen, uh, genuine and the in not so genuine ulama, deviated ah, okay. ulama. Yeah. Okay. So okay. so we are on track. Okay, we're on track. Fine. fine. Okay. So next one. Uh, is it fair to say any question, assuming it is sincere, is a question worth asking, regardless of any thoughts we may have that we don't wish to waste the time, <coughs> or even if our question lacks any specific titles of respect. Okay, so that that's a that's a mm. that's an interesting point, and 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 uh, I think you touched upon this, or we touched upon this earlier, uh, with regards to, you know, if it uh, if you just have a question, you know, you're sincere as a person, uh, you know, you're not you know you're not trying to, but questions keep coming inside your head, and you know you want to ask, and if and sometimes you know these, and you have these platforms, WhatsApp group or whatever, 
So you think, okay, I'll, I'll throw it on there. Uh, mm. How do we how do we deal with with that kind of uh, query? Uh, so uh, I normally see in, uh, these kind of questions, and uh, I say like that the questioner must, must make um, a preliminary assessments for the question itself, right? Um, it, it, normally, a question that really bugs you with regards to your link with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and your ibadah, that's a very important question. Right, so you you need to get get that answered as soon as possible. For example, uh, you are worried whether whether your wudu in a particular state is getting is being valid uh, because your salahs depend on it. Yes, you probably should get get that answered as soon as possible. Or try to get it done as soon as possible. But when, uh, if your question is something that uh, you don't really have to think too much about it for your daily life, ibadat and everything, maybe you are thinking about oh whether the length of my miswak is long enough. Or maybe you're thinking like, how, how uh, am I applying enough uh, surma in my eyes, uh, enough kohal in my eyes or not, whether it's uh, fulfilling the sunnah or not. Now, these are, these are not uh, elements that uh, are going to spur you to oh, lose your, your sleepover, right? Be because uh, you, you still can get this information uh, sooner or later. So uh, when I suggested that a person should make his journal or his diary with the, all these questions, uh, they, they should keep a differentiation of these questions what affects me right now if it affects my ibadah my work right now then it is an important one let me ask that uh, and get that get that out of the way you won't be able to get them all done right away but at least you will be on the right track of uh, setting up the right priorities for your questions and when once those are done then keep on pursuing towards uh, lighter ones without pushing uh, uh, forward for a deadline or anything like that Right, and then inshallah you will get, get, go into the sunnas and the mustahabat and everything, and uh, all this process is going to keep on elevating you. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, is there any other questions? I know we're approaching uh, the time which we said that we would uh, close today's session. We do have a few few more minutes, uh, but if there's no questions, then uh, that's fine. I'm not going to force you to ask questions. <laughs> uh, so what I will do is just ask uh, uh, Mufti Faisal Sahib, Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh to all of you, okay. is uh, is just to maybe uh, a, a sentence or a minute or two, some last some last uh, pieces of advice. My last pieces of advice, uh, and I'm not big on advices, right? But uh, <laughs> what I advise for them is what I advise my own heart that uh, we are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us on the path that is uh, muqarrab to himself. Uh, this, this is our purpose of life. This is uh, our journey of life. And it may take uh, 15 years, 20 years, 60 years. It doesn't matter. As long as we are on the uh, journey and we are progressing, every step in the progress is a good step. And it's, it's an elevation towards the right direction. Our objective and goal is once we die, inshallah, when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not ask us what kind of intellectual debates you had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask her how, how sincere were you in your ibadat. How, how close were you to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, how perfectly you manage your life to make it into the, uh, the good character that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had embodied. Of, of work on that and inshallah you would realize that the, uh, the guidance of the ulama is going to become a companion for you in gaining that good character. May Allah give us all that tawfiq as well. Amin. Amin. Barak I'd like to thank you on behalf of Wifaqul Ulama uh, for attending this session. And I'd also like mm -hmm. to thank the uh, participants also. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means, as Mufti Faisal Sahib said, to draw close to him. That is all our purpose. We want to understand him better in order that we worship him better, in order that our uh, sins are forgiven, and in order for our rank in the hereafter to increase. In mm -hmm. reality, that is the story of this life, and that is the goal of this life. Mm -hmm. And we have ulama, around us we are very grateful and very fortunate that the ulama who arrived on our shores years ago established institutes of learning and also established you know makatib up and down this country uh, that we were very fortunate that we studied our alif bata and then studied beyond that alhamdulillah we've you know we cannot really express enough gratitude to the ulama who established these places we wouldn't know anything really had that not happened uh, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the doer of all these things, but these asbab that he has put in front of us to, for make, for, in order to make that happen. Uh, we continue that effort, we keep, keep company of the ulama, wherever they may be, uh, keep company of the learned, uh, keep company of the pious. It's very important, uh, a little kind of uh, 
uh, a little tweet that I sent out is that if you expect to be amongst the pious in the hereafter, then be amongst the pious in the dunya. It's sure. as simple as that. If you're not amongst the pious in the dunya, then please do not be surprised if you're not amongst the pious in the hereafter. It is really as simple as that. It is really as logical as that. We all need to learn our aqaid first and foremost, our beliefs with regards to the zat of Allah, with regards to the sifat of Allah, what do we believe about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do we believe about the books, this is absolutely essential before anything else. And then obviously the fiqh, which is our, which will, you know, distinguish halal from haram and just keep taking each day as it comes. As long as you're progressing, alhamdulillah, that's a good day. Okay, and if you've not progressed, don't worry. Inshallah, there's tomorrow. Okay, wipe today's slate clean and work tomorrow. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our efforts. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair for all of you attending. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.